Hello and welcome to chapter 6.1 from Stevens' Introduction to Statistics, the Think and Do book. In this chapter we're going to discuss continuous random variables in general for just a moment. Um, probability density curves and then specifically the standard normal distribution. So we're going to start off with some definitions but let me get us into uh, full screen mode one second. Okay. So, again, this is about a continuous random variable, right? And that means there are infinitely many possible values, and it's uh, associated with a measurement on a continuous scale. There's no gaps in the data. Things such as time, distance, height, weight, volume, things like that. In between any two measurements is another measurement. A probability density curve is a graph of a continuous probability distribution. Basically, we can't really do a bar graph or a table. We have to actually have a continuous curve. Um, so there's two requirements. The total area under the curve must equal 1, and every point on the curve must um, have a y value greater than or equal to 0. And we'll be discussing, for the most part, normal distributions, but there is one other distribution that you should certainly know about, and that's the uniform distribution. Basically all of its values are spread evenly over um, the range of possibilities. And so I, I drew this a little earlier. This is what a uniform distribution looks like. Basically it looks like a horizontal line between the um, range of possible values. And the height in this case, because it has to, the area here has to be 1 the height is, by definition, 1 over b minus a. Um, but that's not that important. What's important is that a uh, uniform distribution is essentially a horizontal line. Okay, so we're going to talk about a normal distribution, right? The normal distribution is um, symmetric and it's bell-shaped. Let me finish getting rid of this. Okay. And it is defined specifically by this function, All right? And don't worry, we don't do much with this function, All right? So f of x here represents that uh, the curve in the three graphs above. And if you look at this, this is pretty messy, maybe intimidating, a little scary, but there's um, really only two things going on. X here is the dummy variable, right? That's the input variable. Um, U is the mean of the distribution, and sigma is the standard deviation. Everything else here are constants. Um, and specifically, so everything is based on mu, the mean, and sigma, the standard deviation. And so you get all these curves. And notice, bell-shaped, symmetric, and if the, if you look at this, if you look at the standard deviation, if it's small, that squishes things all towards the center, right? You're most of your, um, data values are near the middle, right? Or the mean, I guess. And then if the standard deviation is large, uh, the distribution is more spread out, right? And again, basically, uh, all the only difference between these various curves is that um, the standard deviation is different. But the, other, the thing that the mean does, right? The mean determines where the peak occurs. So this mean determines whether the, the peak goes left or right. And the standard deviation determines whether the curve is spread out or all compact together. Right? Uh, but one thing's important to notice, and this is very critical, the total area under the curve is always 1. Right? That means the area under this curve is 1. The area under this curve is 1. And the area under this curve is 1. All 1. Okay, and so we're going to talk for a little while in this chapter about the standard normal distribution. And it is a type of normal distribution, only the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And again, it looks like the other normal curves, right? Um, it just has these requirements, the mean is zero. So this zero here says that the mean is zero, that's right underneath the peak, and the standard deviation is one which means this curve gets pretty close to the um, axis there when 
z is around 3. Oh, and z. That is what re we really mean. When we, when we use, usually we're using x as our random variable, right? Um, but when we talk about the standard normal distribution, we use z instead of x. That way we sort of know exactly what distribution we're talking about. And again, area equals 1. This area underneath this curve, all of that area, you add all that up, you get 1. All right, so we're going to try to get some values or some probabilities from the standard normal distribution. And later when we deal with other normal distributions, we will convert them to the standard normal distribution. And the table to find these probabilities is found on pages 288 and 289. There's actually two tables. All right, so let's just take a look at those for a second. If we go here, sorry. We have two tables, one for um, negative z values, right? And there's our curve. And then on page 289, we have uh, probabilities where z is positive, right? And so that's what I mean. Z is to the right of the mean. Okay, so we'll come back to that in a second. But this is the table. We're going to be dealing with this table pretty consistently for the rest of the, the book, in fact. Um, and the probabilities in the table, and here's a little snapshot of what that table looks like. These numbers, you know, you have a number here, a number here, a number here, all these numbers represent probabilities, which also represent areas under the curve, right? And I'll try to shade the area which um, depicts the probability I'm seeking. So for example, this is how you use the table. Suppose I want to find the probability that I get a z-score less than 1.35. And so we can find that in the table, right? And the way we do that is you go to the positive z table. Because notice, 1.35 is positive. It's going gonna, it's gonna to fall to the right of the mean, which is 0. OK, so what we do is we look for 1.3 in this column. So the 1.3 is right there. But that's just the first decimal. If we want to get this second decimal, the 5, we're looking over here. There's the second decimal, 0.05. So 1.35. And when you take this row and that column, that value, 0.9115, represents the probability that I get a z-score less than 0.9115. And specifically, it also represents this area, this shaded area right here. All right, so probabilities can be thought of as areas. And if you do that, it helps you to sort of, I don't know, piece these probabilities together from a more geometric perspective. Uh, so a few, I ask you a few little questions on here. I have the probability of z is less than 1.35 is the same thing as the probability that z is less than or equal to 1.35. And the reason that is, you know, notice the only difference between these two is the less than and less than or equal to. And that's because in a continuous probability distribution, the probability of getting any single value, because there's infinitely many of them, the probability of getting a, a single value in the z range is zero. All right. So we'll never be looking for a probability that z equals some number. We'll always be looking for the probability that z is in some range. Um, okay, and the next one I ask is the probability that z is bigger than 1.35. So that's this area over here. Is 1 minus 0.9115. And the reason we get that, and that answer is 0.885, the reason we get that is because the total area is 1. Remember that, the total area is 1. So if you give me area to the left, which is in the table, and I want area to the right, such as this, then I have to find the area in the table and subtract it from 1. Right? Okay, so that's a positive z-score. Let's look at a negative z-score. 
find the probability that z is less than negative 1.35. So what I'm looking for, this is my standard normal distribution curve. There's my z is negative 1.35. I want to find this area right here, right, the shaded area. So I go to my z table. Now I have to look at the negative z table, right? And I'm looking for negative 1.35. So I look for the negative 1.3 in this column. So there's the negative 1.3. And then I have to add that additional 0.05. And it's not always 0.05. It could be 0.06. It could be negative 1.38 or something. In this case, it's a 05. So now I'm going down here. So I go down this column, across that row, and I get 0 0.0. 885. So that's the area I seek. That's the area, which is also the probability. So the probability that z is less than negative 1.35 is given right in the table. A couple other notes. The probability that z is less than negative 1.35, if you take a look, turned out to be the same as the probability that z is greater than 1.35. And we can see that because we did that right up here probability that z is greater than 1.35 is 0.0885 and the probability that it's less than negative 1.35 is that same value and the reason is because this th these curves are symmetric perfectly symmetric which means this one point negative 1.35 has a positive value up here at 1.35 and this area here is going to equal that area there due to symmetry. Okay, and then um, one other note. The probability that z is less than 0 is 0.5. Why is that? Well, we have two, two things to consider. First off, 0. I'm going to erase some of this stuff. 0 is halfway, right? It's the, it's the mean, right? And the total area is 1. The total area equals 1. And if that splits it in half, that means I have a 0.5 here and a 0.5 here. So symmetry and the fact that the total area is 1 lets us know that the probability that z is below 0 for that area there is 0.5. So this geometric perspective helps you sort of feel your way around the probability um, density curve. So now we'll try a few others. If we want the area to the right of a z-score, and the one thing that's important to notice is that if you go to the table, and we'll take a quick peek, there's a picture there that tells us what the table gives. Right? If you look here, the table gives these areas, area to the left of a given value. There is no table for this area here. We have to figure that out, right? So the way we figure that out is really quite simple. We um, alluded to that earlier. If we want the probability that z is bigger than some value, we call it z1, that equals 1 minus the probability that it's less than some value. And this thing is in the table. So the table always gives you cumulative probabilities below a number. If you want the probability that you get a z above a specific number, you have to take 1 minus the probability that it's below that same number. And examples will make this much easier. So suppose I want to find the probability that z is less than 2.58. It means I want this area right there. What is that area? Right? Um, that's easy. That's right in the table. I look for 2.58 in the table. Let me go to the table. And I'm looking for 2.58. So I'm going to be down here in this row. All right. Now I have to get to the 0.08 column. So I'm going to be in this column. All right. Second to last column. So 2.58. Eight. So that number right there, 0 0.9951. 
That's the probability to the left of 2.58. Right? 0 0.9951. If I want the area to the right, I can't really get that from the table. I take the area to the left and I subtract it from 1. So the area to the right is 0 0.0049. Right? So then there's a couple of your turn problems after this. First part, what's the probability that z is less than or equal to negative 1.23? And again, the less than or less than or equal to doesn't really make any difference. So I'm going to look up negative 1.23 in my table. Negative 1.23, so I have to go to my uh, negative table. Don't get dizzy here. Negative 1.23. Oh, I've got to scroll down. So I'm in this column, or that row, sorry. And this column, there's the, there's the second decimal, 3. Negative 1.23 gives me that number, 0 0.1093. So that's the area to the left, right? 0 0.1093. And so the area to the right, the probability that z is bigger than negative 1.23, is just 1 minus the answer that I got in the first part. So 1 minus 0 0.1093 is 0 0.8907. So this area here, under the curve, to the right of negative 1.23, is 0 0.8907. All right? So we have one other situation to consider. So we have area to the left is given in the table. Area to the right is found by subtracting the area to the left. What if I want the area in between two values, something like this, right? And the way that looks like in inequality form is what is the probability that z, here's the z, is greater than z1 and less than z2. So it's stuck in between these these two z values. So if I want that kind of probability, and it looks it looks like a middle chunk under the curve, then I take the area to the left of the bigger number. z2 is the bigger number, and I subtract the area to the left of the smaller number. And here's an example. Suppose I want the probability that I get a z-score between negative 1.23 2.55. Well, the first thing I do is I look up the probability that z is to the left of the bigger number. Notice I'm taking the bigger number, 2.55. And when I look up 2.55 in the table, 2.55, I'm in I need the positive z scores. Scroll down, don't get to z. 2.55 is what I'm looking for here. I'll erase these old ones. So again, I'm here at 2.55. That's this column. Which gives me 0.9946, right? So that's the area to the left of the bigger number. The bigger z value. 0.9946. If I do the same thing, if I look up negative 1.23, the area to the left of there, based on the table, is 0 0.1093. So notice what I have is this area and then the bigger area. So the area in between those two is basically, I take this area here, the 0.9946, and I subtract that area there, and I'm left with the area in between. Right? And you can sort of see it. If you put negative... 1.23 in here. Let me subtract that off. You get the desired area, which is this thing. Right? And when you subtract those values, you get 0.8853. So, the your turn problem is very similar, only both z scores are to the right of 0. You want the probability that z is between 0 0.058 and 1.77. Right, this is the area you want. Right, they're both to the right of zero, but you can still do this. You do it the exact same way. 
it's going to be the probability that z is less than the bigger number minus the probability that z is less than the smaller number. So you first look up 1.77. And when you look up 1.77, well, this thing gets away from me at times. I'm looking at 1.77. It's a positive z score. So I'll go to 1.7. Seven, so I'm going across this row, down this column, right here, 0 0.9616. All right. 0.9616. So that's this area here, 0.9616. And then if you look up 0 0.58 in the same way, 0 0.58, let's look at that though just to be sure. 0 0.58, I'll erase some of these. It's still a positive number, so we're using the positive z table. And 0 0.5, and then you go down to 8. So we go all the way across. There it is. 0 0.7190. So this area, 0.7190. To get the area in between that we wanted earlier, I take the bigger area and I subtract the smaller. Right. And when you do that, you get 0.2426. And you'll know you did this in the wrong order if you get a negative value. And if you get a negative value, remember these are probabilities, so you can't get a negative probability. So the first clue that you, you switch the order is that you'll get a negative value. And in fact, you'll get the opposite of the correct answer. Um, the other type of game we might want to play here is finding z-scores when you're given a probability. And here's an example. Find the z-score that marks the 90th percentile. We denote that by p sub 90. Right? So what that means is we want a z-score, this thing with question mark, right, is a z-score. I don't know what it is. But the area to the left has to be 90, right? 90% 90 of the values fall below it, right? And so the way we do that, and this is a little tricky, we use the table sort of in the reverse order. We're going to look for 0 0.90 inside the z-table. And when I use this capital, all caps inside, I'm looking at the interior of the table. Right? So let's go back. We're going to look for 0 0.90 inside the table. And we should notice that this z-score is going to be positive because it's, the probability is greater than 50%, so I'm to the right of 0. So I'll go to my positive z value. And when I'm saying look for 0.5 inside, 0 0.50 inside with all caps, I'm talking in here. All right? So it's a little tricky. So you got to sort of search, but you can get the pattern. So we scroll down, the numbers are getting smaller. So we want to be up here, right? Oh wait, we weren't looking for 0.5. What were we looking for? We were looking for 0.9. That makes more sense. 0.5 is going to give you that, 0. So I'm looking for 0 0.90 in here. I sort of scan along, scan along, looking, looking. And then if you look here, we get these two. <coughs> 0.8997 and 0 0.9015. So 0 0.9 is somewhere in between those two. And we're not going to do any interpolation. We're just going to choose the closest one. 0.8997 is only 0 0.0003 units away, whereas 0 0.9015 is 0 0.0015. So this one, 0 0.8997, is the closest to 0 0.90. Right? So let's take a look at that. I'm going to erase some of this stuff. So we're looking at 0 0.8997, and I want the z-score, right? So if I look at that, the z-score starts with 1.2, and the second decimal is 8. So the score I'm looking for, the z-score, is 1.28. So we're sort of going backwards. Instead of looking at a z-value and finding a probability, 
we're looking at a probability, 0.8997, and getting the z-score. Okay. So that's where the 1.28 comes from. Right. 1.28. So this question mark is 1.28. 90% of the scores are below 1.28. So for the your turn problem, I say find the z-score, which marks the 25th percentile. And then that's denoted piece of 25. That is, you want to find the z-score that delineates the lower 25% from the upper 75. So this is what we're looking to find. Right, what is that z-value? I know it's negative, and I know the area to the left is 0.25. So I'm going to look for 0 0.25 inside the z-table. And when I do that, let me erase this get a clutter here. I guess I don't have to worry about it because we're going to be at the negative table, right? These are positive z-scores. So let's go to the negative. We know it's a negative z-score because this area that we're looking for is 0.25, right, which is less than 50%. So I'm in the right, right area. So I look for 0.25 inside the table. And again, when I use inside in all caps, I mean somewhere in here, right? So you scan around. It's getting bigger. Bigger, bigger, bigger. Let me erase these. That's from a previous problem. 0.25. We're getting there. There's a 0.2546. I'm getting kind of close. Um, and if you look, here we have 0 0.2514.2483. So my 0.25 is somewhere um, in between those two values. And if you look at them, it's a pretty close contest for which one is closest. Uh, but the 0.2514 is just a little closer than the 0.2483. So this is the closest we have, right? That value is closest to 0 0.25. And that corresponds to a z-score that starts negative 0.6 and then the second decimal, I sort of have to continue up because I can't fit it all on one page, is a 7. So the z-score is 0 0.67, right? Negative 0 0.6 and the second decimal is 7. So that's where this comes from, right here. Negative 0 0.67. So that question mark is negative 0 0.67. So that represents the, the other type of problem we, we might see. Um, in some cases, I'll be giving you a z-score, and you'll have to find the probability. In other cases, you'll be given the probability, such as 90th percentile, and you have to find the z-score. Okay. That's when you just use the table in the reverse order. Uh, another thing worth noticing, I, I ask you to make these graphs. In my graph, the graphs that I draw are not that great. The accuracy of your graph is, is not important, so I strongly encourage everyone to make a graph. Even if you, you call yourself a bad drawer, you don't make good graphs, don't worry about how good it looks. I've seen people do graphs that look like this. And while that's not ideal, it certainly allows you to get the picture, it allows you to get these geometric perspectives area to the left, area to the right. So be sure to draw graphs as you're working through these problems. And that wraps up, what, 6.1? I will see you in chapter 6.2.